Welcome to Watching Silent Films. My name is Yi Fong, and with me are co-hosts Bob and Lily. Welcome, Bob and Lily. Hello. Hello, welcome. Greetings, greetings. Today on our Watching Silent Films, pick a movie and talk about it. That's what we do. And today we picked uh, Fear from 1917 by Robert Wien. And I think one of the reasons that I put this on the schedule is because way back when we were doing uh, Doctor, the what's it called, the Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, and we also did it in the hands of Orlock. Those two mm-hmm. are the most known of this director's work. And so I figured since uh, Lily liked it so much, it does retain some of the horror elements or thriller or horror or freakiness type genre. <laughs> so, yeah. So that's kind of why we picked this one as well, because uh, most of his work is lost, which is sad, which is very unfortunately typical of silent films is that majority of the movies that uh, were made is no longer available to us. So, which is sad, but, uh, but he made somewhere North of 20, maybe 30 movies, yeah, writer to director. So he's, his in his output rather was pretty tremendous from 1915 to 1938. Um, so he made a ton of movies. Of course, he's known for primarily Dr. Carl Kari is, is the big one. And the, 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 the deeper cut is called, uh, in the hands of Orlock. Not many people know about that one. But now we're going to go into the way, way weeds deep cut <laughs> where mm. most people don't know most of this other work that is available. And we're just going by what's available on YouTube, what we can find. But um, before we get to that, any of you guys had a chance to check out any classics, any movies in the classic realm? Um, yeah, a few, day- a few days ago, I saw one and now I'm trying to remember what it was. Give me a moment, the Lily. Describe the plot. Everyone well, no, if I remember the plot, I'd remember the movie. Oh, okay. I didn't watch a classical movie, but I, it does tie into silent films slightly. Uh, so I'll, I'll well, wait till you're... Yankee Doodle up, Dandy. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yankee Doodle Dandy. Yeah, that's um, that's a good one. Another one that I haven't seen. By, yeah. Uh, nice. Michael Curtiz. Yeah, who is one of the most well-known directors? He's what's called a studio man. He he just he worked for uh, was it Warner in most of his life, I think. And uh, Hungarian-born import, but one of the most prolific directors of all time in in the great golden age of cinema. He did uh, Captain Blood, Adventure, Robin Hood, with uh, I think Errol Flynn. Maybe it was somebody else. I can't remember. All these different yeah, uh, Robin Hoods. Uh, yeah, Errol Flynn. He, he did the Errol Flynn one with uh, Olivia uh, uh, de Havilland. De Havilland, yeah. recently passed away. Right. Uh, At 104. Yeah. Lived a long life. But uh, I think one of the last most well-known uh, actress or actresses from the silent era ever. Probably one of the last ones. Hmm. It, 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 it lived so long. But of course, he did, uh, my, back to Michael Trees, he did uh, Angel of Dirty Faces, Sea Wolf, Casablanca, of course, the big one, uh, Mildred Pierce, Inga Doodle, which is the one you just mentioned. This is the Army, White Christmas. Tons and tons of movies. He, he, he's he's kind of a company man, you know, once, once he got here. Mm-hmm. But anyway, so it was uh, just on a whim or just something that you've seen before. You're trying to share your brother. I saw it when I was little with my dad, and um, I hadn't seen it since, so I decided to watch it again. And yeah, it all it all came back to me, but it's still a f- lot of fun to watch. Yeah, Cagney, right? Yeah, Cagney. Yeah. Have you seen that one, Lily? Mm-mm. Yeah, I don't. I I can't remember the last time I seen it. It's gotta be. 80s and 90s i can't remember <laughs> mm. i big very vaguely it, remember the plot <laughs> well it's a yeah. musical and it's george it's about the life of george m cohen oh. the mu- musician who wrote the song yankee doodle danny and over there and grand old flag and wait was that others. a disney movie nope okay never mind did they do something <laughs> like that though like back old school disney I don't know. Maybe I've seen mm. something similar to that. 
Oh no, that was the Sons of Liberty. Never mind. Okay. <laughs> I think that's Disney. <laughs> Anyway, yeah, that's my classic for the week, aside from this one, which I watched on Monday. Cool. Ooh. Lily? Yeah. So, okay, so what I watched today, even though it's, I think it was made within the last few years, it's on Netflix, so, uh, well, to start, I'm a big, like, 80s rock fan, so I was looking Mm. at all these rock docs, which... I thought most of them were rock docs. So one's about like Adam Lambert joining Queen and why, you know, why the show must go on. I haven't watched that yet, but it's on my list. But um, this one in particular is called Shot, the Psycho Spiritual Mantra of Rock. It's about a photographer, Mick Rock, who photographed all of these famous artists back in the 70s or like late 60s. He was really well known. He's still really well known. Um, He, you know, he did... Freddie Mercury, he did a lot of David Bowie, he was friends with Lou Reed. But uh, one thing I brought up, because the only reason I watched it was because there was a picture of him with David Bowie. And a few weeks ago, I had found an article randomly online telling about how much he actually loved Buster Keaton. And he was a really big fan of Keaton. And in that article, I think it was a different photographer. His, his last name was Shapiro. He's really well known. And uh, back in 75, he was fil- like either filming or photographing Bowie on one of his tours. Um, and he happened to have uh, Keaton's biography with him. And it's like, you know, he they're just taking photos and Bowie's like holds the picture. No, he holds the biography next to him and he looks just like Keaton. And and within that article, it uh brought us to like his more modern uh music videos and he he does do some buster keaton in one of his music videos it Mm. was in 93 (laughs) that it came out so it's still like almost 30 years old but it it was just kind of interesting i don't know tying it into silent film into the modern day that's it (laughs) that's my story (laughs) wow so so it was like a documentary right it was kind of like a documentary about this guy, but he, the real guy was there, so it wasn't. I I thought it was going to be a little bit different. He's like telling his own story of what happened and why he shot all these people. Hmm, uh, yeah. So it was pretty good. That's cool. But yeah, I learned something new about Bowie. Even I'm not a fan of his music, but... I was just like, oh, that's cool. You know, he he likes Buster Keaton. We like Buster Keaton. Hey, I'll mention it on the podcast. <laughs> well, he's uh he's dabbled into movies. He's he's acted in a bunch Oh yeah, of he's acted in a lot of movies. Yeah. So he's dabbled in the acting. He's one of those multi hyphenated people. But um but anywho, uh this week I watched uh Das Boot, the nineteen eighty one uh submarine U boat movie. I watched that not a few months back. Yeah, Wolf I've heard Gang of it. Peterson. Now, which copy did you? Which cut did you watch, Bob? <laughs> oh, I don't know for sure. I really don't know. So here's how you know: <laughs> there is a two-hour cut, there's a three-hour cut, and then there's a five-hour cut. Which one did you watch? <laughs> the two-hour. <laughs> yeah, that's the theatrical release. And then he recently, um, Wolfgang Peterson, who is a, a popular, famous now, I guess, or more. In the last couple decades, maybe older now, he's more into the blockbuster, like he did Troy, mm-hmm. for example, and other movies. But anyway, yeah. so he um, didn't he do like Die Hard? Or? I don't remember that. Maybe he died. I don't okay. remember his um, filmography off the top of my head. But um, anyways, he uh, he he released this movie in 1981, and then he released it on TV on BBC as a mini series so it was like five hours <laughs> and then he, in the 90s Yeesh. he did a director's cut that was three hours long so it's, it's wow. been uh, multiple cuts but i figured i watched the longest one so i don't have to rewatch any of the other cuts since <laughs> i would assume the longest cut has everything you know <laughs> so man yeah. you drop it from five to two hours it's like what are you missing <laughs> it's uh it's a lot of character moments so I think the the whole premise is that it's a U boat, right? There's a bunch of guys from Germany. It's really intense. It's really intense, yeah. In the mm. height of the or the start of the World War Two or something like that, and 
they get in on the boat and they just just documents kind of what happens to war between the veterans and the, the newbies and how cynical they are or not about it and just you know life and death situations well war is really good I, I never saw it I just uh figure it was my list knock off my list you know anyway hmm. so let's uh dive into um fear 1917 Robert Ween and uh what do you guys think oh uh a real quick plot I guess is that um there's this main character c- count uh Grieven, Grieven. or Griven or oh. how do you pronounce that Grieven? Uh, yeah he returns to his old castle after spending many years touring the world and he somehow changed his servants you know are 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 fearful that something's wrong with him so they get the town minister and the minister is like this guy needs a doctor <laughs> long story short he 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 stole a, an artifact from india a statue of buddha and uh and he got cursed by these uh monks from those Bud- buddhist temple and now he's just living his life in fear hence the title of the movie and uh the, the outworkings of the curse is that in seven years from the time that he has the statue somehow he'll be killed by by the hands of the one he loves or love or something like that so that's high level the plot in the summary so overall what do you guys think of this particular one it's only 54 minutes so not that long I liked it. Um, I mean, it called it a horror film, but I definitely thought of it more of, of as a psychological thriller, if mm-hmm. anything. Like Caligari, right? Mm-hmm. Or, or Locke, even. Well, it's it's younger than Fear. I thought it was... I don't know, how do I say it? Kind of more modern besides the big expressions and you know like what is used in caligari i know it's all german expressionism i don't know if maybe it was because it was more the quality of the film wasn't as great as some of the others it just mm-hmm. kind of you're felt... talking about the technical quality like it's really blurry and not very sharp yeah and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah unfortunately but yeah it's the best mm-hmm. print we have i think it's mm-hmm. from a vhs so but i think it works because mm-hmm. it is kind of you know, like I said, I thought it was more like it's a mental game. This guy's playing with himself, essentially. Mm-hmm. So because the quality isn't the best, it's like, well, maybe it's the quality of his own mind because it is deteriorating. Yeah. So, it, you know, for that, it kind of works for the film. But <laughs> even though it's not originally meant to be that way. Right. Yep. I would say also that um, I think it's really neat. Yeah, I. I by today's standard, I definitely, I mean, you couldn't put it in horror, but psychological thrillers. But at that time, I think 1917 and what people had seen on the screen, when you see that ghost walk into the into his mansion, that's pretty frightening. I mean, that's um, something I don't think has been done very much. Am you I mean, right? Around the era? Uh, it depends on what you what the audiences have seen. I thought that was done really well when the, when the yeah. ghost, when he was sitting outside the castle and he sat down like cross-legged and and the ghost of him his his spiritual being gets up and walks into the ca- into the castle. That's the ending. That's the last shot. It, yeah, yeah. I think that's fantastic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but his madness is also, I guess, what contributes to it being classified as horror, but um, quote unquote horror. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, I, I also love, I, I really like the film quite a bit. I I remember thinking when the first scene came on, the music um, was so striking. And, the music uh, was not good for this film. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I agree. When I when I first started, I thought, wow, you know, the, the opening scene, the first five minutes grabbed me. And I remember thinking that, like, wow, this has really got my attention. But then it went on and on and on, like with the overbearing, heavy music. Yeah. <laughs> it was like way out of out of scene for most of the scenes in the movie. They should have been more subtle and psychological, um, playing to playing to the you know when he was calm. They should have been like 
dun, 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 you know? Yeah, you got the big fanfare going on. Oh, my goodness. Well, oh, my God. Thankfully, well, there was a YouTuber who posted under it. He's like, this music's awful. He suggested to go listen to the Nine Inch Nails, like, uh, tr- ghost track albums. They're all kind of weird and obscure music with ethereal sound. So I did it for one of them, and it worked out really well, thankfully. Really? Yeah, because I couldn't, I couldn't do with the music. I, so I was just kinda... muted the film and listened yeah. to something. Else. <laughs> That's yeah, wild. it just happened to work that way because it definitely made it more creepy. Yeah. Neat. Yeah, unfortunately, original score and even soundtrack, as far as we know, is lost and it was replaced by another. I guess col- I don't know what the person but it's a uh, leslie shepherd and they they had this uh, another sound design replaced the original track uh, was, so. it was it wasn't very well done. <laughs> not, not a good sound design yeah well i mean this no. is again all typical of sound films where you know well, it's, it's it seems to me that they weren't watching the film when they were putting the music together <laughs> yeah and that's what i'm talking about is the people who who had these rights would often just throw something together and not because yeah. they were actually trying to mime what's happening on the screen uh in fact that's what you know the accompanist like for piano or organ like the and the model p- type personalities they all often watch the film and then they will react live exactly and, and they exactly. didn't do that for this and they just did some no, random, clearly not yeah random collection of whatever it is so yeah the score wasn't that good which is unfortunately very common for uh, films that are either in co- in public domain, where you get a you know you you either watch something like this in silent, like real silent, or nothing at all. And so I just kind of turn it down. <laughs> it's kind of because you know you when you watch so many, you kind of get used to it. I guess it, 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 it makes me want to like hire an orchestra and do a piece of music to it, so it would be better. <laughs> Yeah, and that's what people do. I mean, that's the that's the work of many uh, of the artisans that we've watched before. Like uh, when we watched the Thief of Baghdad, that's the Mont Alto uh, Orchestra from California. That's one of their uh-huh. things that they do all day. Um, not the only thing they do, but they often will contribute towards you know silent films in that way because of wow. all these issues. Because they all understand how much music affects the final you know enjoyment of the film right and yep. as you can tell by watching this so the muse is not good yeah you know, we, we know that so <laughs> aside that, from that aside I from like that the film. <laughs> i thought i thought the the quality of the film the fact that it was old and um dark and um i'm sure that it, initially it was made dark but the age and um defects i think in some ways, contribute to, in an almost nostalgic way, to the age of the film, and and I, and I kind of like that, <laughs> um, like looking at an old painting that has some, it's like weather worn, you know. But of course, you know the 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 ultimate goal is that if they ha- somehow figure out a way to take the film print. A complete spend money restoration on it and restore yep. it, right? Is to make it super sharp and stuff like that. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, exactly. But beyond the blurriness, beyond the picture and the audio technical quality, which is unfortunately, that's the only way we can watch it. You know, this is not a uh, Dr. Caligari, which you know has been through multiple, it's at least three, four, or more, two or three or four more restorations over this life that we are aware of. So that when you watch it, you can watch it in today and super crystal clear hd quality you know you know that's been afforded us because it's a popular title people recognize it for its place in history film history and they'll often go back to it and so because of all those interests in it there's profit to be made and that's why there are all these organizations taking a stab at it Mm -hmm. multiple times in restoration but film films like this become a deep cut right like i was saying earlier that robert Wien, yes he's a well-known director for that one movie but then most people don't go deeper they don't figure out like what else did he do you know and so mm. when we're looking at like what else did he do he did on un- many movies right 20 30 movies and yet yeah he did a lot many of them don't survive and the ones that survive you know they're on somebody's uh whatever and and they found it through some attic or whatever there's so many different stories of how silent films that were once lost in fact recently somebody just found one a full copy of i forgot what the title i just saw the 
on uh it's a uh, it's popular now uh from 1923 i thought i suppose that last film now they've they found the new print but anyways even mm. if they find the print like you still need to spend you know at least a few if not thousands of dollars on restoring it to uh uh, uh you know a, a quality that's i like, guess fit for today's technology you know crystal clear uh technology to to play it back and mm-hmm. movies mm-hmm. like this that is so kind of deep in the catalog of this director and filmography it's like not everybody's going to want to watch this it's only for right the select few like us who are yeah uh, potentially interested in like what else does this guy do you know and like we'll we'll search out for it and find it and watch it and and kind of talk about it but it's not the norm right and so because of all those <laughs> reasons they don't get yep. the love and attention of the big titles like nosferatu yep. and right Polygram. yeah that is uh harsh reality because yeah. you're right no one besides us is really talking about silent films besides in the groups right. but you know there's so much more to find and you know just to watch but unless someone digs it up and has the money to afford it forget it and that's so, really sad that is to say that you know it may it may or may not contribute to the the story element as you're watching it itself like the the main characters descent into madness but the technical aspect they've always wanted it i mean if you were the filmmaker you'd want it to be the sharpest and the best image that you can experience you know for the audience Mm -hmm. anyways um but you know all that technical issue aside audiovisual technical quality i would say that the the uh, you know first i want to talk about the acting a little bit which is a little bit it's very stagey Uh, i think for sure absolutely yeah there are acting even pre-1915 that were more subtle i think there were really good acting mm-hmm. back then so it's not unknown that you know the actors and actors could bring you know this was good quality acting this was more this was over the top yeah it's one of those uh you know acting styles where it's very theatrical which is mm-hmm. you know, very typical of a lot of silent film eras so they would hire people from the stage yep. to be in the movies I would like to say though that the Buddhist priest Conrad Veidt, oh yeah, was fantastic as he was cast perfectly. I mean his his features are so striking, and I think they used face paint to make him even more striking. Yeah, I mean and, he's uh, a he's a major. I mean he was in the Colorado, and I think he was in. Kim, he was an Orlock, right? He was the yeah. He was, he was a star in Orlock. I didn't realize it was even Conrad till I was doing research about the film. Just because, um, like I wrote in my notes for myself, this is something I would have liked to have a bit more to go on. Maybe because it was the quality that I didn't quite understand it. But um, you know, it was a film that it would have been cool to not be in silent film. <laughs> yeah. Um. But yeah, I didn't realize it was him until I researched. I was like, oh, very cool. Yeah, he's been in a number of movies he's very popular in the, in the silent era and of course later on he would be i think he would be end up being casablanca to, to link yep back he was to the guy Curtis. yep Curtis. well what makes it even more striking is that they do a close-up of his face filling the screen and he's staring right into the camera right. so right um now is it did i pronounce it right fight or Vite? i said vite conrad vite before I think so, so. It could, yeah. I mean, fortunately, it, it could be either or. We're not sure. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Depends on how much uh, the uh, behind the scenes from the 1930s you watch. Sometimes they, they'll have behind the scenes or news clips about, here's Conrad, and then they'll pronounce the name, and then, you know, you'll you'll figure out what it is. Especially yep. for silent film stars that make it in the sound era. They'll often be in the press, and when they are in the press, you'll hear their name pronounced. But uh, but he's a major you know star then and he continues to be a major star in the in the talkies mm-hmm. era. Um, but so that's the acting part. Um, Conrad, of course, is the highlight. Um, the main star is a little bit melodramatic, but then everyone else is on par. But I'd say that I think that the 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 biggest highlight of this story element is of course the the whole notion, which is uh, it's interesting that it's Robert Wien's. I don't know if all of his movies are like that. I didn't read all of the plots of all his movies, but it seems to be a recurring theme of, um, I don't know if you remember watching Caligari, uh, Bob, but the theme of, I don't think I did. I think I came in after you did that. I just meant in general, just 
Oh, I don't think I've ever seen that one, though. Oh, it's a great one. It's worth uh, watching on your own time. And also, okay. the other one is uh, In the Hands of Orlock. I, I, I can't choose which one's better, but they're both really good. <laughs> um, okay. But he, it's a stellar director. and he seems, Are they both by Wayne? They're mm-hmm. both by Robert Wayne, yeah. Wayne, sorry. The director. And he's he seems to be very interested in the same theme. Thus far, those two movies and this movie. What theme all, is that? Um, just the fact that the mind is deteriorating and we can't ah, tell whether madness. or not it's the truth or not. I gotcha. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and it's it's a kind of an advanced plot in um plotting for those times. But I think also because of the his training and his background. So Robert went just a little bit um kind of going back to when we were doing the uh Caligari and Orlock uh Pocket. We gave some background on Robert when he was born. Uh, I think in now Poland, um, and he studied law, but um, he ultimately became he came into the career uh, in the d- entertainment career through acting a little bit, and so he had some acting with, along with his uh, younger brother, and through small parts and bit parts he got involved with the film starting in 1912 and it just kept going and so um his background he trained also with he must have trained with all the same people that uh trained also with um fw Murnau and fritz lang and all those guys because they all come from german expressionist cinema of the same era and around that sort of era of cinema they um are involved with so german expressionism itself uh has a lot of roots dating back before world war one I. I mean it's 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 not just film it's a it's architecture it's dance it's painting sculpture like it's the arts right it's not like mm-hmm. a singular thing where it's like you know it's it's not just film, right? Film is, um, I would say, uh, influenced by what what the movement was. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. So the movement was a lot, a lot more than just that. Um, but the they all train with. Uh, I forgot. I'm trying to find this guy's name, and I can't remember now. But um, there was a guy who was on the stage. Max something, and ultimately he would be the person who who would sort of have a big influence on sort of ge- German expressionistic. Uh, oh, the guy who played Nosferatu, you mean? Not oh, what that was his guy. Name? Not uh, that guy. That's his the... name was Max, though. It's like yeah, it's uh, there's a lot of Maxes in Germany, but <laughs> um, but anyway, I, I can't remember. I can't find it now, but um. If I find it again, I'll 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 uh, mention it again next podcast or something. But like they all come from this like training ground of how that expressionist style comes out on stage in the theater, where if you if you experience live theater, uh, you could look at the stage. Max Reinhardt, that's where it goes. So this guy, Max Reinhardt, <clears throat> he, you know, he he would stage all these elaborate um, uh, theater productions where. They would paint the shadows into the theater sets, so it's not just use of light to create shadows. They would use paint and art deco type to create the shadows inside, etched into the the actual set. So that obviously makes it very striking. And and you know people like uh, Robert Wien and Lang and many many German early German directors would bring that into film. Right when they were doing film, they would especially Caligari, we bring these sets where it's like, you don't know when the the shadow ends from the lighting and when the shadow starts from the painting of the set. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? And so I feel yeah. like even in 1917's Fear, he did the same thing here. It's a lot more expressed, I guess, no pun intended, for uh, the, the, the Caligari in the 1920 Caligari, much later on in Orlock and on. He seems to lean into that more, but you could see the early elements of that on this film. Because if you look at the tapestry of the the castle set, you could see some of that happening on the steps. There's a lot of art pattern on the sets, 
on the, the, the in fact, I think they have shared sets too. There's the, the, the Indian temple set. Almost looks like an entrance of his other castle set mm-hmm. where he stores the, uh, the statue. But anyways, the, all of these sets have sort of elements of light and shadow at play. You know, light and dark, light and dark, just playing with that. Not expre- you know, not as uh, not as striking, I would say, as his later movies. But you could see the influences right away, right from the get go. You know, at least on this movie. And of course, we don't have access to this other movie, so we don't really know for sure <laughs> because mm. he's made at least something like ten movies before this. By this point, so this is already he's already very mature, I think, uh, into his career. At this point, and so, so yeah, um, lots of lots of the the set pieces are are brilliant, even though there aren't a lot of them. Um, yeah, there aren't too many sets. Yeah, but there. Uh, There's only a few different location locales for the exactly. show, for the whole movie. But finally, the the primary feature I think of this movie and movies that he's that we, of his that we've seen so far is just this detail about this person's um, fate, for the lack of a better term, um, where, you know, he, it's, it's, it's the whole old philosophical question of free will versus determinism, right? Mm. Which, you know, the Germans love to debate too because a lot of their own philosophers from Immanuel Kant to, uh, I can't remember them now, but there's a lot of philosophers from, you know, that, that region uh that that talks about you know free will determinism they've had those arguments uh in the past and they probably still were having those arguments in ph- philosophical debates and i think you're just bringing some of that uh f- philosophical discussion yep. to film well as far as the storyline goes i mean i thought for for a while in the movie when he was um when he decided to set his mind to science and came up with a cure for hunger. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then he decided to set his mind on women. Uh-huh. And uh, he reminded me, I thought that I thought the story was going in the line of the life of Buddha. Right. It was very similar at that point, but then it abandoned that very quickly. And I said, oh, okay, it's not going that way. <laughs> yeah. um, and it ended very abruptly. <laughs> It was a very sudden and odd ending as far as typical American uh, stories go, uh, films go. It didn't have um, much of a conclusion except, you know, he accepted his fate, sort of, got committed suicide. Right, and so that's the whole, that's the ending of the film, is that, you know, first the setup was that the curse from the the buddhist monks or something was that he would die at the hands of the one he loves and at first we thought it was the wife that he ended up marrying and well that's what i wondered i wondered whether he actually thwarted the curse or whether he himself shooting himself being the one who loved himself the most was meant to be the conclusion of that curse yeah that's the conclusion of the curse is that he was shot by himself because he's the one that loves himself the most. Hence the fulfillment of the prophecy. But that's it's like, debatable though. It is because that's the thing about this movie is that it's the whole notion of like self-fulfilling prophecy Yeah. where, you know, would he have made all of these choices that he made uh, if he actually believed like he clearly believed in this curse. So he made his life, he altered his life so he would just like, lived his life to the fullest or so, so he thought because he knew in seven years he was going to die that's that's why he yeah. did all of those things during those seven years but like if he if he just threw all of that away and said i don't believe in this curse then nothing would have happened right it's the whole <laughs> it's self-fulfilling <laughs> prophecy of like i believed in this curse because of this overwhelming guilt that he stole this thing and now right this curse is going to come to fruition because right. he also tried can, to get rid of the statue and it came back somehow. I can see where the yeah. st- where you're you're correct in saying the story is pushing us to that question. Right. Um, I was even debating 
whether the curse was made to be correct because he himself when the buddhist monk first came to him wanted him wanted the buddhist monk to kill him right and he and he refused instead explained the curse to him and then in the end he killed himself so the question i have is perhaps he didn't love himself as much as his wife loved him because he was willing to kill himself he right. wanted to die but that's the kind of question I think the audiences would be left asking when they walked out of the theater. Well, probably multiple questions. It's one of those yeah. in- interesting movies where it, it does ask all these questions that it doesn't really answer, but it also kind of plays with all of those notions for the philosoph- philosophical debates you know, of our mm-hmm. time. And, yeah. Um, yeah. It, that's why I said, going back, it's the notion of like fate versus free will. Like, you know, the fate is this curse. You know, he's fated to do this thing. And is there anything he can do in his life, the choices he makes and the things, the consequences he lives with, are any of those things going to ultimately alter uh, the the fate, quote unquote, the, 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 the curse, the, the outcome of the, the thing? Yeah. Or does he actually have free will that he's actually but going it's... to choose something where it's going to alter the outcome, right? Right. <laughs> but the mysticism of the movie isn't portrayed as just being in his head when you see the buddhist monk outside the castle and the there's a spirit walk inside the castle right i mean we're not we're not led to believe that that's happening only in 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 the in the in the um count's head right or he he may have (laughs) already been dead when the monk first visited him and that everything after that visit point basically was a dream, right? <laughs> See? Oh, man. The Wizard of Oz. Like mind yeah. flip. Yeah. Lily was like, oh, no. I didn't think about well, all this. <laughs> no. I mean, wh- one thing I wrote during the uh, the film, though, is like, if you allow an announcement like his death to rule your future, it's going to bring you nothing but insanity. Right. And that's exactly what it did. Yes. yes. So, but, I think that's but, more directly to the plot of the movie. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That goes to the heart of the matter right there. Yeah. Oh, man. Because even I was wondering about when it comes to Buddhism, because uh, people say it's a, like a Buddhist st- statue. It looked more Hindu to me. It looked you more know, Hindu the, to me, too. Yeah, it's very Hindu. <laughs> you know, you have to – I feel like if we knew a bit more about that religion, too, it would kind of clue us in. Because, you know, when Conrad, as the priest – goes after him with like his aura or to get the statue i think that does have something to do with uh their religion yeah or it to... should have been hindu they should have said it was hinduism uh, i'm trying to think because you know it's like it's all about spirituality and your aura and yeah the chakras but ob- that's going way too deep now <laughs> yeah hinduism would have fit fit more with the curse too than than buddhism yeah. Right. Buddhism wouldn't wouldn't want anyone cursed. <laughs> That's well, true. Yeah, Buddhists but, are pretty chill. But it's probably it's probably a mis, mis, mishmash back in the day because they they yeah. all have the same roots. Because the roots for Buddhism that did come from India and did somewhat evolve from Hinduism a long time ago, hundreds if not thousands of years ago. But anyway. <laughs> Yeah, that, that makes sense, because now that you say that, I mean, to me, I always think Buddha is more like main Asia, like yes. China, and then Hindu is just straight India. So that is that is interesting that they would get kind of blended together, because they are right next to each other, technically. Well, they, it, it originated there, and then yeah. it, it basically, you know, it was an export. It, it's like an export of Hinduism into the Far East, and when, once the Far mm. Easterners got their hands on it, it evolved into Buddhism. But then, like, mm. it evolved further. Now you have Taoism, and there's mm-hmm. so many variations yeah. of Buddhism. Even even Buddhists themselves don't really agree on a singular monolithic faith of what, what right. how to define Buddhism. But anyways, sidetrack. So <laughs> <laughs> that's I think from a philosophical perspective, I, I think that's the. I think that's yeah, it might be a sidetrack, but it does relate to the movie. I mean, oh, the debate sure. oh, of sure. yeah, the yeah, debate yeah. of the depictions of it being a Buddhist is yeah. definitely appropriate. It's just not very clear that the movie doesn't right. really uh, tell you exactly what's going on right. with that. Story. And since we're telling the audience about the movie, that's it's something they can note when they watch it themselves. Hopefully on mm-hmm. mute, right? 
<laughs> yeah, <laughs> go listen to Nine Inch Nails. Or go find one of their albums. It's yeah. so much better. <laughs> now, do we know if this was the complete film? To me, it seemed totally complete. I don't know. But I don't know. That's one of those things. Like, um, I don't know. Seemed complete maybe to is, me. Maybe there's other scenes in there that would explain and clar- clarify. Yeah, because the only thing. part that seemed like cut was the very end but at the same time with the way the movie goes it's like okay yeah it does a very it is a very abrupt ending right but i mean at the same time you assume the priest just takes a, the statue back to the temple for where it could did, be didn't he throw the, the statue into the water yeah the guy did throw the statue into the water but it came back somehow mm. yep <laughs> ghosts can't get rid of the man that easy. <laughs> anyway, that's uh, those are my thoughts about it. Um, it it is asks you all these questions, and then uh, it kind of begs you, it draws you into the narrative, and it tries to uh, basically make you think about what happened in this story, you know, and. Uh, but those are the not. best kind of films, though, when you do have to think about it. Because, that, I don't know, I love psychological thriller films. Like, Shutter Island's a great example of a thriller like that. That's I mean, right. It's, it w- it's, uh, it's yeah. definitely very similar, I think. You mm. know? Like, in terms of, like, the person's uh, brain and whether what he thinks is reality or not. Yep. Mm-hmm. So. A Beautiful Mind. He has another one, yeah. Yep. I haven't seen that one, but that's supposed to be a good one, too. Yes. Well worth seeing. I think, like, for films like these two, why the horror goes with the thriller. It's just, you know, you you really never know a person. And, you know, we all like to say we do, but I think that's why we are just so drawn to thriller-type films. Because you never know how the mind's going to react. Right. I don't know. I don't know. That's just my two cents. <laughs> Yifong, who is this person that's doing this recording us with us? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I read this uh, review uh, from Century Film Project um, 2017. Uh, I don't know the person's name, but they basically wrote about how here I'm going to read an excerpt saying uh, in terms of the story however this is a classic horror tale is reminded right from the start the structure of a H.P. Lovecraft story with the character returning mm. change from an experience abroad then revealing what happened to another character who concludes that he's insane the level of disconnect forces the audience to question how much of the story is true even as we know from the narrative purpose the story proceeds as if the character's perceptions are real so you kind of it goes off on the unreliable uh, narrator concept of the story elements. Right. And then there also, he goes on to the article making a point about how like uh, it's similar also to the story of the mummy where a person's passion for collecting art uh, results in him being cursed by an unknown right. part of an exotic culture. And there are, and of course, those other works like the Mummy talks about colonialism, colonialism, and othering, and all that stuff. So, mm-hmm. who is the monster? Who is the victim? So, it, mm. it it's another look and another perspective and angle that we haven't really talked about that much yet. But it's pretty interesting. Very interesting. <laughs> Anyways, that's uh, my thoughts about it. Um, I'm sure there are many other elements that uh, you can do more takes on it. But do um, you guys have any more parting thoughts about this film? Well, a little chuckle. When uh, when he first arrives back <laughs> at the castle <laughs> and he says, bar the gates, you know, no one goes in, no one comes out, you know. <laughs> I immediately thought... Um, you know, like his like his people are like, um, 
but my family lives back home a few miles away. <laughs> yep. <laughs> just um, it's not allowed to leave. Just, just struck me as a little funny. I mean, I know he was mad, but <laughs> like, uh, can I resign now, sir? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Lillian. That's, that's all for my party thought. <laughs> no, I mean, I think I said what I wanted to about this film. Um, I don't know. I don't know what else to say about it besides it is, you know, give it a watch, you know, even though the quality is not the best. It's uh, it makes you think. Mm. That's yeah. really it. Absolutely. There are a lot of... Um, Elements like that, and many, many yep. of the films surrounding the era as well. And the moral of the story is: don't steal Buddhist idols. <laughs> That's <Yep>. right. <laughs> That's the moral of the story. Don't steal. Period. Right. Let alone right. Something exotic like that. <laughs> All right, folks. Um, that wraps up today's podcast. Today, and um. We can find more of our stuff at watchingsilentfilms.wordpress.com and that's watchingsilentfilmsplural.wordpress.com Send us an email if you have any comments, thoughts, or questions. Watchingsilentfilmsplural at gmail.com And um, this episode is produced by uh, Lily and edited by Fong and uh, that's it. So we'll see y'all next time. Thanks everyone. Take Thanks listeners. Thanks Bob and Lily. Take care. <laughs>